So hi, my name is Pozhanyuk. Uh, I'm CTO of Golem, and I'm going to give you a not very short presentation to what challenges we face when we develop Golem, when we have developed Golem, when we develop it now. And I don't want to disappoint you, but this presentation is not about blockchain at all. Uh, the technology is a bit in parallel to blockchain. We use blockchain, we use Ethereum uh, for some purposes. But everything is isolated from the user and from, the cl from all clients. So all parties that, take, that are used and take part in the computation uh, do not see the blockchain directly. So let's get started. Uh, what is Golem? Golem is a platform for sharing your spare computing resources. And the point is that if you have a computer or a spare, I don't know, cluster, you might would like to make money by just providing it to the network and not caring about any infrastructure. So Golem should take care about it for you. And if there are enough users willing to pay for your computation, then you're going to make money, provided that you have something that is interesting to them, enough power or interesting engines that you can use and rent, or maybe simply low prices. So three sides to, to Golem, as we see them now, are requesters, providers, and developers. Uh, developers are software developers who provide computational environments for Golem that can be distributed across the network. Requesters request some computations that can be sent to the network, and providers are users who can simply give out a bit of their power to the network and hopefully make some money by renting their spare CPU cycles. So what's the challenge for us? Uh, our main and first use case is non-deterministic use case. It is Monte Carlo-based rendering. And the problem with this use case is that it's very hard to verify because in this setting we have peer-to-peer -peer network and where game theoretical approach comes in. And every party in this network would like to make as much benefit as possible without, with doing as little as possible, maybe even cheating. We have to be able to verify and compare results to make sure that neither party is cheated. In case of blockchain, we have states that change in a deterministic way and can be verified. For example, Trubit can be used for deterministic problems, well, a subclass of such problems, but it's there. And in Golem, we unfortunately cannot use any such existing solution. So why rendering? Because rendering produces nice looking images. Hopefully these are nice looking. And at the same time, it's described by a pretty well known integral equation, which behind which there is a theory that we know pretty well, and it's which is well researched, and in fact, whereas comparing results may be difficult, understanding the theory is not. We know what, what are the trade-offs of using this method, we know how to deal with verification here, and we know what are the risks. Uh, one additional thing I'm going to tell you about is a constant. It's additional actor in our network. It is a special purpose optional entity that secures the network. Well, it increases the guarantees of computations, that they are valid and that they are, that the payments are securely and verifiably transferred. And that communication, well, is at least as, hmm, well, the communication between two Providers and requester and provider has to be assisted in some way in cases when requester or provider goes offline. So consent is there to assure that it happens eventually. Uh, last but not least, we have Intel SGX. It's a technology which, is, which, which has been for quite a while with us, but it seems to be getting widespread audience in the blockchain community and probably will be used in more and more blockchain-related uh, projects. So what we started with when we started implementing Golem 
Golem is a project we've been working on for almost four years now. It started as a very, very, very simple use case for internet rendering. So the first use case took us about two to three weeks to implement, and it was the simple mini light Python renderer used in our company. And it worked pretty well. We thought that those two weeks were, were just enough to understand everything, and we moved on to a bit more advanced renderer. It's a PBRT, open source renderer. We implemented this as well. It worked pretty well. We were pretty happy with it. But later we started digging deeper into the problem. So in fact, when we tried to split tasks and distribute them in our intranet, it was pretty easy because it boiled down to splitting the task, being able to verify the results in a way that they, well, look good, no one was cheating, and we had to collect them and provide the final image. But in the decentralized setting, it's much more difficult because we have multiple computational backends that we cannot control. We have multiple operating systems that users would like to use. We don't want to impose any operating systems to them. They should be able to use whatever they have. And they, of course, because it's a peer-to-peer -peer network with multitude of hardware, we should expect multiple hardware configurations from multiple drivers, for example. So this poses a challenge, not to overcome it, but to incorporate it into the network. And we also need to help our requesters who would like to send their tasks and data. Because they set it to untrusted network, and they don't know who computes their tasks, who sees their data, and the requester has to be able to tell the network not to compute its, his tasks any longer. Because it may first take too long or maybe outdated and the requester would like to cancel it. So the requester has to configure the task so that it can time out and it can get interrupted easily. So what the Golem network looks like, it's like this, and this poses the challenges I mentioned before, especially the verification. When the requester sends his or her data to the network, he expects a valid result in a reasonable time. Unfortunately, you cannot expect anything like this in a peer-to-peer -peer network because providers, well, by definition, would like to make as much money doing as little computation as possible, maybe none, and they can cheat. They don't have to be rational. So requester has to be able to at least probabilistically verify the results sent back by providers. And as you can see, this setting is very challenging. Each side of this equation here can tamper with the data and can make it hard to collect the valid results. So the provider in this setting should be somehow isolated from the invalid requester's tasks because requester may be willing to, for example, take control of the provider's machine. And the requester at the same time would like to get the valid results and do not pay for invalid results. And as you can see, the network we would like to secure the network as well, because if a requester, even willing to pay quite a lot of money, would be able to use a lot of providers' computers to create a botnet, then it would pose a threat to the network itself, not only to the computers in the Golem network, but to all computers in the internet, which is very bad. We will have to avoid it at all costs. So what's more? The last thing, I'm not going to talk quite a lot about it, but this is important part of this equation, the payment scheme. This, is, this scheme is implemented on Ethereum right now, and we believe that it's going to stay this way. And all parties in this equation are, well, working towards getting results and making money. And this is as simple as that. But there are quite a lot of challenges here as well, because First of all, you need to set up a price. You need to be able to pay the right price for the right results. You need to be able to verify the results before you pay the price for the result. You have to somehow evaluate the single cycle of your CPU or maybe your GPU uh, and put it into the network. 
And if you are a software developer, you would just like to make money by providing software to the network. So if, for example, you're a render developer, you would like to implement a licensing scheme that would allow you to make money on every single transaction that takes place between requester and provider who uses your renderer. And this applies to other software as well, but this is very challenging as well and requires additional means that of well, dealing with this uh, problem. It, it cannot be directly implemented in the protocol because in the peer-to-peer -peer network we have only two parties, requesters and providers, and we don't want to hard code any special logic special that would be used only for the licensing and we have to deal with somehow else. And I'm going to describe it. It's implemented by consents. So, no, we have consent here. Consent is a, this special purpose uh, node or group of nodes that is used to both secure the network and implement any additional logic that may be required to run the computation and to pay the developer for their software. So in, here it means licensing scheme is implemented by consent and in the consent. Okay, so let's go to our first use case and the first real challenge we have. So as you can see, photoresic rendering right now is something that, well, something. It is a solution to, to the equation I presented. And right now most, or maybe even all, uh, photoresic renderers use some sort of randomization and Monte Carlo methods to compute the distribution of light in the scene. And the problem with this approach is that Monte Carlo in introduces noise. And each party, each requester in fact, has to carefully set the task so that the final noise is either not seen or acceptable and the requester knows that the results sent back from the network are valid. So for example, for the first two images on top, it would be very hard to say if a part of this image is valid or not because it's mostly noise. Whereas the image on the bottom right is pretty good looking and maybe compared with other images, similar images and well, human at least should be able to tell the difference and we believe that algorithms should also be able to verify that two images are very, very similar or identical from human. Okay, so what are the sources of, sources of non-determinism? Well, mine sources are this multitude of platforms and the way numbers are recorded on them, simply floats. For example, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin and other blockchain solutions use deterministic way of this, this, describing state. In, in Ethereum you have only integers. And right here we inherently use, well use, it's inherent to this task that floats are used. And different standards of encoding floats is a problem itself. But uh, additionally, multiple platforms, multiple GPUs, multiple drivers can also be a source of non-determinism in this setting. If we use random number generators and multi-threading, then it's getting even worse. So implementing a deterministic software with random number generation and GPU in this setting is possible, but it's very, very hard, and we cannot assume that the software that is going to be hosted on Golem uh, will be in any sense deterministic, because it's entirely up to the software developer to provide the renderer or other solution, and this solution may use algorithms that are not deterministic. So, what are the problems with non-deterministic? Well, first of all, we need to be able to compare and verify res results, so that before we accept them and pay for them, we're sure that the results are good, or at least we are sure with very high probability. What else? In machine learning, well, we can have deterministic inputs, but computation can be either, either deterministic or non-deterministic, and the results are non-deterministic. We may believe that the neural network was trained the way we expected, but we cannot be sure. And in, in case of 
proof of work, for example, we have deterministic input, deterministic output, but not deterministic amount of work. And as you can see, those three classes of tasks pose different challenges because in rendering you have both non-deterministic result and computation. So to verify anything, you have to non-deterministically rerun part of the tasks and believe that the outcome is what you expected. In machine learning, you can use some determinism during computation, but result are non-deterministic, so you still have to guess whether the results you were provided are valid. And in the case of proof of work, most of the time you're not getting any results. So to verify whether the provider really done his share of work, you need some additional means to uh, well, verify it. In our case, we are only dealing with rendering, but of course, those other use cases should be uh, implementable in Golem. So what's the problem here? In blockchain setting, we have a consensus between multiple of nodes and the global state uh, to which all participants agree that it is the valid state. In Golem, it's quite the contrary. We need consensus between small number of nodes, maybe two, requester and provider, or requester and a few providers. And this consensus should be local. We don't want to share it with the network. The main point here is that the entire Golem network has a dynamic state that we don't want to track. We only want to make sure that those parties that are involved in a transaction and computation get the valid results and are get paid for their work. So, okay, a bit of uh, equations here. Uh, I would like to present you the problem of Monte Carlo rendering a bit deeper, but it's still pretty informal, so that you see why this use case is very interesting to us, and where the problems are, and from what they arise, and also how we can tackle them. So let's say that I believe that you are know about basics of probability. So this is just a probabilistic space. I restrict here this presentation to continuous case. So where density function can be used to, impl well, to implement a measure, a probabilistic measure, which means that once we integrate over this measure, the entire set, we get measure one, and this is good. So when we have random variables with some specified density function, we have the, these properties of the variables. We can calculate as expected value, which is simply an integral with respect to the probabilistic measure. We can calculate variance, we can calculate expected value, and which is linear uh, with random variables, and we can also compute variance of the sum, sum of the variables, which in case of independent identically distributed variables is not linear, but semi-linear because constants are squared. Okay, so what we are going to use in the Monte Carlo integration is estimator based on mean means simply is uh, sum of random variables, well, evaluated random variables divided by the number of the random variables. And as you can see, the expected value of this estimator is, in fact, the expected value. Uh, one, more, one important thing is that for the multiple random variables, which are independent and identically distributed, variance of the estimator is proportional to the uh, inversely proportional to, to n number of samples, which unfortunately means that the standard deviation is inversely proportional to the square root of number of samples. And the standard deviation is more or less our estimate of the error we get when we try to approximate uh, the mean, which means that if you'd like to halve the error, we have to quadruple the number of samples, which unfortunately is inherent to Monte Carlo methods and poses a problem here. By the lowest strong numbers, we can see uh, that this estimate 
uh, s s simple mean is a good estimate of the expected value. So what are the Monte Carlo methods by Wikipedia? So this is a broad class of methods that can be used to evalu evaluate problems by randomly sampling a domain, evaluating the samples and doing something with them. In case of integration, we just need to calculate averages. And the more sample we use, the better the approximation of this integral is. So what it looks like in practice is like this. By definition, uh, average of uh, expected value of a function is simply a integral with respect to probabilistic measure. And whatever the density function cho is chosen, we get the different estimation, well, estimation, different expected value. But this allows us to easily calculate the mean of the function. So if you look at the bottom, this is the estimator of the average of the function with respect to some probability density function. And if, for example, we take the simple uniform distribution over the domain that we use, then we get the average, which is pretty useful because, as you can see here at the bottom, if we multiply it by the domain measure, we get the estimate of the integral, which is exactly what we are looking for. So there are two problems. The first one is the problem of diminishing return, uh, the problem that I show you on the previous slide. Uh, well, you have it here. It's standard deviation proportional to inversely proportional to the number of samples. So to make it a good estimator, we have to make the initial variance as low as possible. And there are multiple methods, multiple methods of reducing variance. One is importance sampling, meaning that we would like to choose probability density function in a way that is in accord with the pro probability density that we use. And the other is domain partitioning, which is stratified sampling. And if we partition the, enter the domain in a good way, then we are going to get a good, pretty good estimate of the integral and low variance at the beginning. It's still inversely proportional. Well, the, the standard deviation is still inversely proportional to the square root of number of samples, but the initial noise is going to be much lower so that we need less sample to get the valid results. And as you can see, the general setting for this integral is sampling the function divided by the probability density function. And we need to assure that samples, that xk, are generated with the exam this p density function, it's, as we can see here. So all this is well, pretty useful, not only in terms of calculating integrals over finite domain, but also when we would like to calculate integral of this form. This is a Fretel integral. As you can see, the well, maybe not necessarily, but L is on the both side of the integral. And to solve it, we need to resort to some other methods, mostly numerical then just analytically evaluate the integral. So the, that equation was a rendering equation. What we are focusing on solving when we solve the rendering equation is the transport of energy. And in fact, it's the distribution of radiance in the scene. And more importantly, the distribution of radiance on the eye, on the lens of the computer, cam of, of the camera, or maybe a pixel in the monitor. And what you get when you take a photo, for example, is a measurement of radiance in the scene. This is exactly what all renderers do. They approximately 
measure this radiance and return it as a color to you. So by definition, this is radiance is part of flux going to a differential solid angle uh, and falling on a unique projected area because radiance is interesting to us only in terms of uh, surfaces. We don't want, well, at least, at least in this setting, to compute radiance uh, in uh, participating media, such as smoke. So once we know what radiance is, we can come up with some function describing the light surface interaction. And this function is called bidirectional reflectance distribution function, and it, it describes how much radiance is reflected in, in a direction when some radiance falls uh, from, well, not, not radiance, this, in fact, some radiance falls on a projected, uh, on the area from the solid angle, and we want to see how much radiance is reflected in a specific direction due to this uh, event. And this is described by, by BRDF, which, as you can see here, leads us to pretty simple equation, which describes the amount of refracted radiance with regard to incoming radiance from all directions. Omega here denotes the hemisphere. hemisphere. And from here we see that outgoing radiance in a, in a point in a direction omega is equal to emitted radiance from this surface, because materials may emit some light, plus the reflected radiance due to interactions that were described on the previous slide. And this boils down to this equation that I presented before, and it is the rendering equation that is almost uniquely used in renderers to estimate radiance in, uh, in pictures and in movies. And well, even if you would like to use participating media, you, you also use this, uh, you also use this integral equation because with some fancy tweaks, you can solve it and still get results for broader class of phenomena described in computer graphics. And this is what renderers do. So this is linear equation, well, in linear. Uh, it's a linear operator, which means that it can be distributed uh, between multiple uh, parts of domain to compute. And when we move to Monte Carlo, we will be able to see that this is inherently parallelizable problem. So when we describe it as, as operator, we can see that it expands to an infinite series. It's von Neumann series. And this series in physical setting is uh, going to converge because the more bounces in the scene, the less light is going to arrive uh, at, at the point because some part of this radiant energy is absorbed by materials. And as you can see, in fact, this can, it can be described like this. So we know how the, this recursive equation looks like, and we know how to solve it because we don't have to evaluate the entire sum. We only have to compute light interactions up to some predefined number and how renderers deal with it. So, because each single sample can be evaluated on a separate machine, a separate, separate thread, but for the smaller subset of the entire image, so these small rectangles correspond to final slices that can be composed into the final image, or we can, well, we, Renderers can simply estimate the whole image, but with less samples used, and the requester is forced to average them to get the final image. Both are difficult in terms of verification, 
both can be tackled. Uh, we are focusing on the left picture right now, but we know what to do in this other case as well. So just to give you a glimpse of how it looks like, this is the second case when we have multiple samples. This is a simplistic picture of what happens there. So we get the all, well, all the samples, we average them, and then we see how many samples were outside of this accepted error area, and we discard them. So estimating this accepted error area is hard because it depends on the number of samples that we use for each sample, uh, well, number of samples used in this evaluation by the renderer, and here each sample is a resultant picture that we use. So if we can estimate the accepted error bounds well, then we can easily remove outliers, and this means that pictures who are outside this uh, area should be discarded and providers shouldn't be paid for them. So what it looks like in the diagram is we get the input, the renderer renders something on a provider machine, then we get auto-verification by whatever means we feel, well, whatever algorithm is implemented. If it's rejected, then it's re-rendered. Well, and then it goes to manual verification because we can never be sure that auto-verification work correctly. It's only probabilistic. So it's also all, always up to the requester to accept the final result. This is exactly what happens in t when you use render farms, and this is only what happens. There is no auto-verification. You have to manually verify each result, and it, this is fine because if you send your work to the render farm, you put some trust in the render farm, and you expect that the render farm is going to send back valid results. So if you get any valid results, it's not due to the malicious actor in the render farm, but maybe due to some hardware malfunction or driver malfunction. Oh, so this is what happens. This is the default approach, which is easy. Well, you split the task, send it, and get it back. And that's it. You just need to be able to specify how to split the task and how to collect it to the final render. In terms of decentralized setting, unfortunately, we have game theoretical problems where requester would like to get the results for the least price possible and the valid results. And the provider would like to get as much money, well, yeah, as possible, doing as little computation as possible. We assume that those are rational actors, because in case of irrational actors, provider may be willing to attack the network, even by not, when he is not getting any money at all. So we have to be able to verify the results sent back by the provider. And this protocol, this is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, which means that it's known to everyone. It has to be fair to everyone, and it has to be simple, so that everyone knows what to do in case either requester is cheated or provider is cheated, or there is a dispute. Uh, and this is a problem because in case of blockchain, we can verify everything bit by bit, which means that simple comparison works. In case of Monte Carlo rendering, we cannot. We need some means of comparing the results, and at, this, at the same time, we need to know where to compare the results. Because we can send it to the network to make the verification, or we can try to do it locally, doing some, well, repeating some computation and some small fraction of the computation that was sent to the provider. And this is what happens, in fact. This local verification boils down to rendering with the same input parameters small fractions of the scene and comparing the results. And if everything passes, then we may assume that with some probability, depending on the number of samples and the coverage of the input uh, picture, that this is the valid result. Of course, this has to be accepted by the requester. We can also use redundancy, which means that we can, for example, render each tile twice. This should, en twice or maybe more times, this should enable us to verify the results, but 
it imposes higher cost, which increases in an expected way linearly with the number of additional samples that we would like to use to verify the results. So this redundancy may be tweaked in a way that each sample verifies, well, each sample, each, each slice sent to a provider verifies more than one slice in the final image. For example, if you imagine rectangles, which are horizontal and vertical, then one vertical slice may verify a number of horizontal slices. And this, of course, this is not one-to-one -one correspondence because each, each slice verifies only a part of other slice. But in this setting, we can set a parameter that allows us to set the number of pixels or maybe the fraction of the area that is going to be verified by each slice used. And in this setting, no provider knows what, how, what, which part of the, his task is going to be verified by other providers, which make it, makes it harder to cheat. But at the same time, provider can guess that it, he's being verified by, for example, inspecting the average price in the network. But as, as I said, we can use uh, this parameter to verify the small fraction redundantly, and this way, provider won't be able to tell whether his slice is verified by anyone or is not verified at all. So, what's the, I said that there is a problem with comparison of images. Right here we have two images rendered with pretty similar parameters. Requester required image to be rendered with 30 samples per pixel, and provider sent back the image rendered with 29 samples per pixel. And as you can see, if you take the row difference, well, right here you see nothing. There are some pixels that are barely seen, but those pictures are pretty much indistinguishable. But in fact, it's not a valid computation. So if you want to be able to verify automatically the results sent back, we need to be able to distinguish between those two images. And this is what happens here. To, very, to compare images, we use two functions. One function is a transform function, which takes the input bitmap uh, as its first input, and the other bitmap as a second input, and transforms it into some other bitmap with enhanced properties that we're interested in. Right here, it's an edge enhancing transform, which results in error that, well, the difference is quite noticeable. And as you can see at the top, mean square error is very high, and structural similarity index is pretty low, which means, oh, you can see it here. So right here, mean square error is low, and similarity index is high, which is quite contrived here which means that those images weren't rendered with the parameters that were desired. Well, this the second image. We wanted 30 samples, we got 29 samples, and we can see that something was wrong here. And this result can be rejected. Well, okay, just one step back. Not necessarily rejected, because as I said, it's also, it's up to the requester to accept the final result, and maybe the requester is satisfied with it and is willing to pay for those 29 samples instead of 30 samples because the result looks good and maybe good enough for him. So what are the other problem, well, other examples? One is machine learning example where you can, as I said, you cannot tell the exact output, but for example, you can train the network in a way that it is, well, it is trying to find features that are not desired by you in the beginning. For example, if you'd like to see cats in pictures, you may additionally train this network to see reddish dots placed somewhere. 
And if those dots are not found, then it means that this network hasn't been trained the right way. In case of proof of work implemented in Golem, we have this setting. So for, we have n nonces that we would like to inspect and look for a number of zeros, leading zeros in a hash. So we split it into multiple subsets. Well, when we have n0, n1, and nk sets of nonces, and each provider is supposed to compute proof of work for each nonce. So look for a hash of specified number of leading zeros. And we can do similar to what mining pools do and expect, well, not expect, force providers to gather all nonces with number of zero, zeros which is less than target zeros, but is some predefined number of zeros. This depends on the number of nonces that we would like to inspect, and has, this number has to be high enough that we can statistically tell that enough work was done. Because most of the time, we are not getting the result we're looking for. And to verify it, when we get those results with smaller number of zeros, we can verify that statistically each provider really computed all the required nonsense. Okay, so introduction to consents. Because in this setting, it is still possible to, well, either cheat or not maybe, not collude, but not pay providers for their work. Or maybe by accident going offline may result in problems with fulfilling the uh, agreement between provider and requester. And consent is there to assist with all those situations. So in case of dispute, uh, provider can resort to consent to, for a higher price to verify that he was cheated by requester and requester is going to pay from his deposit that he puts in consent's contract. Uh, consent can also assist in packet delivery and additionally is only an optional entity which only increases the guarantees of the network but is not a forced part that has to be present all the time. So what it looks like. In terms of enforcing communication, we can simply assume that if any of the parties goes down offline, then consent at some point is going to deliver the message and probably force one of the, well, requester in this context to pay provider for the work because requester can send, send the task, get back the results and then go offline. So in this case, provider is not going to get any money. And as consent is only an optional actor, then it's up to the requester and provider to agree to take part in tasks that involve consent. Because it's optional, so they can decide to only use providers and requesters that do not, are not registered in consents. It's a bit more risky, but if they're willing to take that risk, it's just fine. Okay, so. As you see, it's enforcing communication, additional verification because if requester says that the provider provided invalid result, provider can ask consent for arbitrage and consent is going to verify his results. And if they are valid in fact, then requester is forced to pay provider for, the, for his or her work. And this is enforcing payment. So communication golem, this is a bit detailed. But if requester gives a task to provider, then there is only a s some specified window during which a response should arrive. If you are not in this window, then you can communicate with consent to force the transmission. Uh, additionally, when there is a conflict, conflict is a situation, well, it's not conflict, it's dispute. It's a situation where requester for some reason rejects provider's result 
end provider would like to get the due payment because he or she is sure that the computation was done properly. So in this situation, we have this communication, this communication takes place and consent can probably, well probably, up to some probability because it's still Monte Carlo. Well, I'm talking about rendering, so consent is re-rendering the provider's result and verifying that it is what is expected. And if consent believes that it is, with very, very high probability, then requester is enforced to pay. This does not ensure fairness, but increases the guarantees. So you have, well, you, you and we have to be aware of that. Because if you were able to assure fairness in all cases, then this network would be bulletproof. And each network would be bulletproof. And as, as you know, it's very hard to assure even in the blockchains where proof of work has to be used to assure that the state is not fair but consistent between nodes. Okay, so what about reliability? Well, consent right now is a bit centralized solution. It can be implemented as a, on a cluster, but it is a, an actor that is not part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. It's a separate entity, and its implementation is up to the developer of the, well, consent or, uh, or the use case that is integrated with Golem, and consent is part of this use case. So, whereas Golem as a network is a peer-to-peer -peer network, consent is optional separate entity implemented in a semi-centralized way. But it's not a problem. We assume that arbitrage is costly for all parties, which means that providers and requesters are going to resort to consent rarely, very rarely. Which means that consent, don't, first of all, doesn't have to be up all of the time. The second of all, there is not, no real incentive in attacking consent because it's a, maybe a simple, single point of failure as it is a centralized solution, but it is an optional part. So it's optional part that is being used rarely by anyone and that is very costly to use. So it increases the guarantees, but not because it verifies the, the results very often, but because it can verify the data. So it's similar in spirit to what we do with state channels when we can resort back to the blockchain to verify the state. Most of the time you don't have to do this. You can use the state channel or micropayment channel without looking at the blockchain. Only when there is a dispute, we can be sure that the blockchain gives us guarantees. Right here, consent gives us higher guarantees that the result is valid. Okay, so can it be decentralized? Yes. Ultimately, it can. Right now, it, it is not. It can be decentralized up to the point of using the cloud, but we aim to implement it as a fully peer-to-peer -peer solution, and uh, SGX-like technology can be used to do it. And we believe that it can also be used to distribute other server-like solutions, not only consents. So, a few words about SGX. Uh, it's getting more and more attention, as I said, in the blockchain community. Uh, SGX is an internet technology used to reduce the surface of attack on a machine, and it's reduced to the hardware part only. So SGX is, in fact, a solution which allows application to first allocate securely uh, part of memory to which a data and code can be loaded and to prove that this data and this exact code was loaded and is run. And the host hosting this solution, this is called Enclave, cannot tamper with it in any way. So, well, okay. When you provide a code, you provide an interface with the host. Host is not secure and it's not trusted. 
So if you implement the code in the way that allows this communication to attack your enclave, then it's up to you as a developer to, to be blamed for this. But if you implement it the right way, then you're getting pretty high guarantees that this enclave cannot be attacked at all. So you can store the data, you can do some scientific computation, you can, for example, which is important for us, do verifiable computation. This is very, very important because right here we can make sure that your computing task, be it a rendering task or a proof of work task or other task, really happened and was computed from start to the end. And this is something that is, is, I don't know, for some reason skipped by others, but I believe that having computations that can be verified, and this, is, this applies to arbitrary computation, is very important here. So, what is an enclave? In spirit, it is something similar to a DLL or uh, dynamic library, because it should be SO. System, state, system object, okay. Uh, because you put this code into the enclave and this code is responsible for doing some computation. Because enclaves are secured from OS, from drivers, from VMM, from BIOS, from other high privileged code, then they are allowed only to do computations inside the enclave. So when we implement the DLL that is going to be loaded into the enclave, you have to make sure that it's, it does not use any OS, any I.O., and that is only for computations. And if you would like to use enclave with the external world, you have to specify e calls and o calls. This is the API that can be used to communicate with encla and the enclave with the host and host with the enclave, which is not secure, but you can control it. And once you do it, you can run the enclave, which is open for anyone that you would like to give access to this enclave. And if the enclave accepts communication with some other external party, then the external party can be sure that whatever happens in the enclave is secure. Whatever happens between this party and the application running the enclave is not secure. But if the communication, well, it's easy to establish a secure channel between the enclave and the external world, which means that once it is done and once it is proven that the enclave is run, then you can have the secure channel and be sure that your computation, computations are performed in the enclave and are secured and cannot be tampered with. Okay, so what it looks like. When you create an enclave, you have to specify statically for this SGX version, stack size, heap size, statically specify how many threads are going to be used, send your public key, because when you implement an enclave, you have to attest that you are, well, the author of this enclave, so your public key has to be included, and software version product ID just for the sake of keeping track of the enclave and upgrading it. And as you can see, once it's launched, you use e calls and o calls. This trusted component enclave can use o calls to the untrusted component, which is the host machine, and the application, which hosts the enclave, and e calls come from the application and can, for example, be result, results of external communication with some client. So when you launch an enclave, there are quite a, quite a few parties taking part in, in this. Uh, in, in both in communication, the computation, and the and, and play uh, lifetime. So we have SGX app, which is untrusted, which launched the enclave, and that can be proven. And we have a client who would like to compute something on the enclave, well, in a secure way, or retrieve something from the enclave. So before that can happen, the client has to make sure that this enclave, which is hosted on a remote machine, is in fact the one that he is looking for. So SGX allows that, and it's implemented in hardware. Uh, this is called remote attestation, and the cl client can request quote, and Clave generates the quote. This quote can be verified by, unfortunately, right now, by Intel attestation service. So which means that if you would like to use SGX, 
you have to somehow get the blessing from the Intel, at least for now. But once it happens, the client can communicate with Enclave in a secure channel and no one can see what happens in the Enclave after this. So this is what, there are two ways of attestation, this local attestation, if you can host two Enclaves on one machine, then those Enclaves can attest to each other that they're running. And there is a remote attestation, which is the process of attesting to the client, which is hosted somewhere else on other computer uh, that the enclave he's interested in is really the one that he would like to communicate with. And this happens by means of quoting enclave, which, which is a special enclave implemented by Intel, which first of, first of performs local attestation, and after it's done, it sends the quote signed by private key for this processor that can be verified by enhanced privacy ID implemented by Intel, which, as I said, is not very good because it makes Intel a crucial component of this whole picture. So, what's, these are the cons of this technology that both launching, oh yes, I haven't mentioned that, when you launch an enclave, there is another entity used, it's called launch enclave. This enclave is also provided by Intel for now, which means that Intel can, in theory at least, disallow some enclaves to be hosted by anyone. And the second and more important part is Intel attestation service, which is required to verify quotes, but shouldn't be required. In fact, notion of trust should be put only in the ESVAL, ISVAL, and this is uh, independent software vendor, so this is a software developer in our setting, and this software developer implements the enclave and should be the only party that is responsible for attesting the enclave. Because if someone sells uh, proprietary software and would like to make money on this software, then he has skin in the game to provide it the right way and the best way possible, so there's no, well, no real use case where ISPA would like to cheat providers with attesting invalid enclaves. So what it looks from the Golem perspective. By default, we have those four components, requester, provider, and software developer, which are core components and optional consent. And we can add SGX to the picture, where both consent and software developer can use SGX and attest to others that, first of all, software being produced by the developer, which is going to be hosted on a provider's machine, is the valid software, and we assume that it uses SGX and provides an enclave, so the software developer would be uh, the actor and entity responsible for attesting that the provider really runs the software produced by the software developer. And in terms of consent, consent can use SGX nodes, for example, to verify tasks. Because consent is this expensive solution and optional, then it can resort back to SGX technology, which may cost more. But in those rare cases when context would like to ask, consent would like to ask about it, we are willing to pay more just to make sure that the computation was valid. And there are a few ways when SGX can be added to Golem as the platform. First of all, well, it can, consent is required in this setting anyway. We cannot, we can make it optional for arbitrage, but if a software developer would like to implement a custom licensing scheme, then this is going to be implemented as a part of the consent. And being able to decentralize consent is one of our goals, which means that SGX can be of a good use here. Uh, the other thing is, well, yeah. And this can be used by keeping an enclaved backend where consent can do dispatch 
for some tasks that SGX enclaves can solve and send back in a verifiable and probable way. And, well, other solution, yeah. We can, for example, implement one server solution as a group of peer-to-peer -peer nodes with enclaves. And if the, this, the number of nodes is large enough, we can be almost sure that most of the time the service is going to be online and we can be sure that, provided that we can attest enclaves, that the computations on that nodes are secure. So how can we use it to our needs, to this non-deterministic verification? So there are quite a few approaches. One is simple. We can rerun the whole computation on the Intel SGX enclave. And this is pretty optimistic because we cannot be sure if uh, using enclaves imposes much performance hit. And if it does, then rerunning the whole computation inside the enclave may not be a viable solution because it's going to take too long. And at the same time, it may be too expensive because uh, nodes with SGX enabled may probably uh, wish to get more money for providing their hardware. At the same time, we can use those nodes to redundantly verify parts of the image, well, image, parts of the task. And this is a bit, well, from our perspective, it's a better approach because it scales up to the point where this performance impact is more or less in balance with the other nodes that we use and the time that is required to compute the whole task and gather the results and verify them. So the longer it takes to compute the task in the, inside the Intel SGX, the less enclaves would be used to verify results. The faster the SGX is, the more SGX nodes Expect, by ex well, we expect the more SGX nodes to compute. And as you can see, SGX supports paging EPC's enclave process cache, page cache, which means that you can run almost any process inside, inside the enclave, provided that your code is not large enough, not too large, but it's going to definitely hit your performance. So if you can put a small code and data fingerprint, well, if you have a small code and data fingerprint in the enclave, then the performance may, may not be that bad. But if you have large RAM requirements, that you're definitely going to be hit by it because SGX would have to swap in and out pages for you. So, a summary of this a bit long presentation. Um, in Golem, we have to deal with non-deterministic tasks and we have to deal with automatic, well, approaches to automatic verification of these tasks, which results in those comparisons that between pictures that I've shown you and dealing with the game theoretical problems that arise from using peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, our Monte Carlo renderers is used because, first of all, it produces nice images, which is good for requesters and testers. But at the same time, we understand the problem uh, very well, and we know what are the trade-offs of splitting the tasks in different ways and how we can tackle the problem of comparing and verifying the results. Well, we know how we can improve the network security with SGX and how we can expand in terms of scalability here. And additionally, we have consents, which are optional part for arbitrage and for providers and requesters to have better guarantees of fairness, but at the same time, consent can be used by software developers to implement custom licensing logic licensing logic which may not be 
even in minds of anyone right now because using software in Golem setting is something quite different than what happens right now. So it's me again, Piotr Janiuk. I hope that you get something from this presentation. And if you have any questions, then we're going to have some time. Thank you. So uh, it seems to me like one of the, the core components to getting um, verification working in this thing is, 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 is the consent uh, nodes. Um, so my question is, well, who, who, owns, who controls these consent nodes? How many nodes are they? And how, how do you choose as a requester or a validator uh, or executor which consent nodes? do you use? Because effectively, they're effectively like escrow, escrows for your um, transaction. Okay, so I'd just like to repeat that consents are optional nodes here. So the protocol itself is known to everyone and consents just assure the guarantee, well, make the guarantees of valid computation and payment higher. Uh, right now, consents should be hosted by the computers, well, by the software developers, in fact. So the logic that is hosted on consent is bound tightly to, to the uh, product that is used. Well, in case of rendering, it may be any commercial renderer. In case of other software, it may be any solution. So whoever provides this solution for computing task should also provide infrastructure for consents right now. We can do this, but in this setting, notion of trust is put into the software developer. And as I said, software developer has skin in the game of providing the highest quality service, which means that the consents should also be hosted by him because he or her, because it, well, makes it pretty stable and pretty reliable this way. If some other parties host the consents, they may not really be willing to provide the highest quality service possible because they are not going to lose money if they provide an invalid or low quality service. But I mean, there might be a cases where I don't necessarily trust the software developer. I might trust their code because I can see, because their code might be open source and it might be a for example open source project. But what if I don't trust the software developer and I want to use my own consent, or there's some trusted third party that between the executor and I, we both trust, is it possible to define your own consent? Well, yeah, it is possible, but this is a separate actor, which means that you communicate with this actor outside of the Golem protocol. Well, it, it is part of the Golem protocol, but not part of the peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So if you communicate with a consent, you exactly know that this is not the consent that is hosted by the software developer, but by someone else. If you trust this other party, for example you, then you can communicate this consent and get the guarantees that this consent provides. Okay, let's get a question from the audience. You have a question? Yep, how, how does Golem arrive at a price for each bit of computation? So in other words, how does it match supply and demand from providers and requesters? Uh, so, well, it's an open market, so it's up to the market to define the price. We don't know the price. Uh, requesters would like to get their job done for some price. If they're not getting it, they probably are going to set it lower, and providers are going to set the price as high as possible. Uh, it's in the Golem client, the, the matching mechanism between the prices. So, well, at this point, it's hard to say wh wh whether there's more supply or demand because we are on a testnet. We believe that uh, there would be less demand than available supply because, as we can, as we know, probably render farms are not rendering all the time. They have their idle time. So we believe that in Golem, we also there will be more supply available, and we will have to think about the demand most. So there's no kind of like pricing mechanism or auction mechanism or anything like that at the moment. Is it just sort of that's sort of to be decided. Well, in fact, it's not an auction. It happens in your own client. Maybe in the future there will be an auction, but I believe that it should converge to the prices that you would get if you implemented an auction. Thanks. Thank you. 
Yeah, just to follow on to that, um, I'm guessing to actually calculate to actually calculate that supply and demand, you have to figure out how to how much an execution is actually going to cost. So do you have some kind of predetermined way, or how do you actually uh, charge per execution? Is it per uh, CPU cycle, or is it per time ex per seconds passed, or is it you know, what mechanism do you use? Is it per like Ethereum, Ethereum for example, they have a gas cost per instruction? Yeah, this is a good question because each approach is a good approach. Uh, for the time being, we charge, well, not we, providers can charge requesters for the task executed. So it's up to the requester to define the task in a way that is going to take exactly, well, as close as possible to the exact time that a requester wants to be hosted on a provider machine. And if this, this is the case, then you pay for the time and the task at the same time, which is equal, but in fact, you pay for the task. And if you overestimate or underestimate the parameters, then you may pay a higher price for the, to the provider for the computations that took a fraction of time that you expected to take. Got a question there. Um, so in your presentation, you gave the example as a Neumann expansion that you were computing. So is it limited to that, or basically can it work with any series expansion? I have more questions on top of that, but that's the first one. Well, you mean the <laughs> the use case, or because this Neumann expansion was just an example of how we can tackle the integral equations, uh, and this ex well, this expansion converges because of the physical setting of the problem, because we want to render physical phenomenon, and if you define the function in a valid way, this function describing the right reflectance, then you won't get convergence and you're going to fail. So you have to choose functions that specifically converge? Yeah, that is, well, so it's, in fact, you can do it, but it, it means that you are pretty low level <laughs> rendering programmer, but uh, most of the time it's chosen from a menu, and when you have a modeling package, then you choose materials, and those functions uh, correspond to materials that you use. Okay, and last thing is, uh, so not all computers are created equal. Um, so do, like, how do you break down the series and like, basically like, share out the, the problems to these uh, disparate levels of computation? Okay, so, so this series is something that is used by the renderers inside, so they, they're, f well, they should be implemented in a way that is computed as efficiently as possible. But having said that, you know that each sample used is one evaluation of the series. It's only one, well, in production environment, a single pixel may require thousands of samples. So one sample uh, corresponds to one series evaluation. So this is a very small fraction of, it, of the computation. So your, the granular, granularity is down to, eh, not maybe simple pixels, but small chunks of pixels or some small areas. So then what is the possibility? What, what, is, what is the probability in realistic numbers that someone could cheat you? Is it, 90, is it something like 50% or is it more like 99% or 1%? <laughs> I cannot tell really because we can tell only after it's launched and enough people are there. So just like in Monte Carlo, you need enough samples to estimate the probability. We have not enough samples to give a good estimate of that. To what extent is developer uh, job to implement all those algorithms like auto-validation and rendering algorithms? And is it Golem's network job or and you provide a level of abstraction? Or does the developer have to implement all those algorithms for validation and rendering and looking for the platform, actually? Yeah, okay, so I focused on validation here, but the point is the protocol itself should uh, give other ways of assuring trust, no, not only consensus, not only verification. Uh, so the easy response is yes, it's up to the software developer to provide all these mechanisms, but at the same time, Golem protocol provides uh, reputation system, and even with no verification at all, if we have a good reputation system that eventually is going to converge to values that are meaningful, which may result in malicious providers being excluded from the network. Yeah, because my second, 
question was to how do you mitigate possible issues in the developers' algorithms? And you said that you're gonna have a reputation system, right? Yes. But, but this is uh, one of systems that may be used. If SGX is wide, well, widely adapted and possibly not bound to Intel, this, well, the tightly, then it may solve the problem as well. Um, my question is actually regarding the reputation system. So um, exactly how does it work? For example, um, where are the reputation points stored? And also, for example, is it like if I got higher reputation, then I get more chance to get particular tasks or, um, yeah, does, <laughs> the, uh, yeah um, can, I, can we have more like details? Well, uh, okay, so current implementation is only a local reputation, which means that you have your local estimate of the reputation of the providers or requesters we interact with, uh, which means that the reputation is stored in your local machine. Uh, ultimately, we're going to use a global reputation where I cannot tell you exactly how it's going to be stored. It's going to be distributed and checkpointed in a blockchain for the fairness and safety. And when you have a high reputation, then first of all, you're most more likely to get tasks and you should be able to give higher prices. And at the same time, requester may be willing to resort to you because with your high reputation, the requester wouldn't have to recompute the partial, partial results and do verification, which may be important to the requester not to waste his own resources to verify your tasks. Can you raise your hand if you have a question? Uh, let's go over there. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> have more questions about consent? Um, is there any fees involved in the, in the regulation, in the arbitration pro protocol? And uh, well, to whom do they go if, if there's any? Do they go to the person who's hosting the consent? And is there any time guarantee in, uh, during which I'm going to get the final decision on the, on the dispute? Okay, so about the fees. Uh, consent is an expensive uh, service and you pay for communicating the consent. Well, if you would like to ask for the arbitrage, you have to pay upfront quite a lot. Because if you will ask for arbitrage, you have to be sure that you were cheated and that you're going to get back these funds. So, consent are expensive to communicate with and once they are found that you were cheated, they are going to give you back this payment that you this fee and the payment for the task. So this is one thing. Uh, and the second... Second thing was, uh, is, there, is there any time constraint yeah. on the consent to, to answer? So we cannot guarantee that because a requester can also provide a malicious task that won't compute in a time span that, well, that won't compute. So may compute indefinitely. So consent has a timeout and if during the timeout there is no result, then there is no result unfortunately. But this is the attack from the requester, which is something that I haven't discussed here, because right here we have provider who provides valid result, in his opinion valid, and consent is used just to verify that this result was actually computed in the value way. Yeah, I think, had, I think there was a question over there, so can we take the mic there next? But in the meantime, uh, one of the questions I had was, um, since uh, if the cons if consent misbehaves, is it possible to get a cryptographic proof of that misbehavior so people can know not to trust that specific consent node anymore? Well, consent is not there to misbehave. If it misbehaves, then it's something very, very wrong with the consent. Well, it can because, well, y well, yeah, it can, it is. But it's not a regular actor. So if consent misbehaves, then you just don't use this consent and you don't use the software at all, never, ever again. So basically, if consent misbehaves, you're screwed. Constant misbehaves, then the software developer is screwed as well. So, well, but you're screwed by the software developer who would screw you anyway. If you bought his renderer, for example, without any consent, you can expect that he's going to cheat on you anyways. So, and you can do nothing about it. But you're assuming that the software developer is a rational actor. What if the software developer gets compromised by, by a malicious outsider or a hacker? Then you, then you can't assume the software developer is, is going to be rational or has its interests. Yeah, yeah, but it's not going to last. So if he's a rational actor and he's going to compromise, it's going to 
set up a consent infrastructure that's working, yes? And he should at least. And you can believe that, for example, he may or he or she may give you back your, well, not fees, but recalculate the results and rerun the arbitrage, for example. Um, let's have the next question. Uh, so I have probably a question about this, again, about this pairing algorithm. So once you have a task to execute, you need to choose an um, execution platform, right? How do you choose it? You always go for the cheapest one because probably you also need, uh, I don't know, to know if the node is available or not. Do you store all those information on, on the blockchain or not? Because yeah. I guess then it generates a lot of traffic, right? Yeah, so each single task is probably not going to be stored in a blockchain. Maybe groups of tasks are going to be checkpointed, but it's not happening right now. Uh, what happens right now is that when, once you define a task, you broadcast it to the network with the required caps, and the providers uh, are try well, they verify whether their subtasks that they can compute uh, fit their capabilities, and then they can ask you to accept their involvement in this particular task. And so they, they can ask you, you said you set the price, and you set the capabilities that this provider has to pro provide. For example, the CPU, the power, and the environment that you have to have on the provider's side, for example, render versions on, well, the version of the renderer or RAM, CPU, and so okay, on. So you publish the task and then... And people, yes, they okay. get back to you. And another question, do you, do you have, or do you plan to do some mining? So like now you're based on Ethereum, so it's like on offloaded, but do you, do think of like mining. So basically for executing tasks for the others, you, you get a chance to, so like useful proof of work, let's say. Well, uh, as I said, yes, you can use it for proof of work, but if you'd like to use it for proof of work to mine Ethereum, for example, then you would really have to calculate if it is a viable solution because you have to pay for the node's time. So this node is calculating for you, you're paying this node and you're not guaranteed to get any Ether because the nonce may not be found. And it, I, I don't think it is, well, I don't think it pays off. It may pay off if you, for example, have a special nodes that can do something for you for free because they would like to, that may be yes. But you have to some agreement outside of the protocol and south of the golem to do it. Uh, on more of a pragmatic side, um, so in terms of uh, rendering, you've got an example down. Like, what do you have in terms of fluid dynamic modeling and like thermal flux modeling? Do you have any? Do you have anything, like, anything in the pipeline for that? Well, we don't. But this is, is one of the use cases that we look into. Uh, in fact, one of our employees is right now doing his PhD thesis on. Uh, fluid modeling, so, well, computer, computational fluid dynamics, in fact. So, yes, it can be done at all. So, what applications do you actually have available now? Uh, regarding this subject, none. I just want to follow up on the, the discussion you had about the integrity of the content provider and everything. So, when I trigger the arbitration, who, where, where, where is the fund locked? Is that does when the, the person who deploys constant has to deploy a smart contract where the funds are escrowed during the arbitration as well? Or is it just saying somewhere else? Yeah, it, it's deployed in the escrow, but the consent owner does not have the access to this escrow. You have to sign from all sides, you have to sign uh, these transactions to, to, to take place. So the consent arbitrages and gives its signature but consent itself is not allowed to move these funds. And so in the, in the unlikely event that it gets compromised, as, uh, as you were saying, uh, what happens to the funds? Do, do they stay locked in there or? They stay locked in there. Okay. Well, I think the question is, like, let's say, for example, what happens if, uh, let, let's suppose that the requester is malicious and uh, consent goes, gets, uh, gets compromised. So then you have two parties on, in, the, in the overall escrow um, that are compromised. So then does that, does, not, does that not allow 
uh, the requester to steal the funds? Well, in fact, if requesters collude with malicious consents, then it might be possible. Yeah. But if that happens, that's once again, you are a software developer, software provider who tries to screw his own customers, which may happen, even is worth, but it's something highly unlikely because, well, to do it, you would have to get quite a lot of money from them. And consent is accessed very, very seldom, which means that there is not, enough, not, not too much money in the escrow. For this to pay off, there would have to be quite a lot of disputes, which is quite highly unlikely. And even if that happened, it's well beyond constant capabilities because it's a centralized point, which can only arbitrage up to so many uh, disputes. And if so many disputes happen, then it means that something wrong with the network as a whole. So the consent is not, not, not an important part here. Um, but, but I think also the point is that, um, it, it, sure, the, it, okay, let's assume that even the software developer doesn't want to screw over their customers, but at the same time, the software developer or the escrow could, go, could get compromised, right? By someone who doesn't have that, their interest in heart. Yeah, of course, but if you use a cloud platform right now, you pay them, you can pay upfront for some service and you cannot get that service done, and you're in the risk here as well. So this is a similar situation. <clears throat> when consent is decentralized and running SGX, then that's not the problem anymore. But if you have centralized solution, then yeah, that's the risk. But that's not only consent. That's, that's the world as it is right now. Um, anyone raise your hand if you want to ask a question? Um, let's go back there again. <laughs> hey, man. Um, so, what is the variance you're getting from going to traditional render farms and like what is the price like what's the savings you can make by using golem versus a traditional render farm uh, well if you have a traditional render farm then you pay for the infrastructure you pay for the additional employees that they have to hire uh, and pay for the special hardware that they can use and in case of Golem, you don't pay for all of this. You just pay for the bare hardware and CPU cycles or GPU cycles. And in fact, uh, if we have a render farm, <laughs> there is no problem for render farm to install Golem client as well. So if render farm has some idle cycles and would like to well, break even on maybe make some small profit, then can also install and use Golem. Um, so rendering is clearly the focus right now for Golem, but going forward, I don't know, 2020, 2021, is it literally going to be open to any sort of computing? You talk about machine learning, proof of work. What essentially this is a protocol to just join um, someone who needs some computing to get done, right? And rendering is the first step. Is that right? Yes, that's true. And there are two phases. The first one is being capable of dealing with MapReduce uh, tasks in an efficient way. And after that, we would like to introduce uh, some service-like solution where you can host any computation on, on the node. And it can be persistent. Because right now, we get the computation and the result. And we would like to host something like server, which is, can keep state and is persistent. Um, hi, my name is Arun. Uh, my question is um, related to health. So in terms of Golem, can it be used for like drug testing, molecular modeling? And if so, is it like a saturation point when it gets to genomics and precision medicine in terms of power? Oh. Well, I, I believe that there may be some saturation point, but <laughs> if we have enough providers, then it's very, very far away. Well, the saturation point is all computers on, on the earth that are available. But uh, for Golem, that depends on the number of providers in the network. And as for the problem statement, I, I believe that Golem is pretty well suited to file for, for such tests and file for computational hemistry as well. So th those tasks can be parallelized pretty, pretty well and should fit Golem. Um, so that's all we have time for. Uh, let's give you a round of applause for the presentation and the feeling.